any discussion about climate that dares to ask about the science of climate is shrouded in a climate of fear. I know this firsthand. Despite that, I still want to have these conversations because I want to try and understand as much as I can about climate so that I can make the most informed decisions that I'm able to make. Today I want to try and understand why and how we got to this point about uh, fear of discussion about climate. Why can't I ask without being called a denier or heretic? Recently I was speaking to a long-time associate because I was trying to understand the role of carbon in the troposphere, which is where we live, versus the stratosphere, which is two layers above, because there's the tropopause and then the stratosphere. The comeback to me was, oh yeah, I forgot you're a denier. Nothing about the way the carbon acts in the troposphere versus the stratosphere, just, oh yeah, I forgot you're a denier. So how am I supposed to come to a better understanding about the role of carbon in these different layers of the atmosphere? Because they are different. How do you have an informed discussion when that's the response? So much of this label and slam and shut down of discussion appears to be rooted in the idea the science is settled. Well, where did that idea come from? As best I can tell, it seems to have started when President Barack Obama in his 2014 State of the Union address said, the debate is settled. Climate change is a fact. Well, that's a nice little dance around the idea, because I'll agree with him, climate change is a fact. It always has been. But that's not the way in which President Barack Obama's statement was intended to be heard, nor was it. Obama's declaration ignited a firestorm of responses, and it became the rallying cry of millions of people. Now, it's easy to label someone as a result of this as a heretic or denier, because after all, didn't you know the science is settled? I've done my best to look into how science works because of this. I thought, is science ever, ever really settled? Well, first, you know, let's acknowledge that science is really good at explaining what has happened and in many cases can pinpoint exactly how and why. I also learned that in science there is constant discovery to the point where we will never truly know the exact science of climate or anything else. So that comes to this point where we all have the right to say, uh, my mind is made up. I've heard enough, my mind is made up. But that does not, however, mean you are right. So in my attempts to try to understand the science of anthropogenic climate change, it's clear to me that humans are playing a huge environmental role. I, for one, want to know exactly what we're doing, what we can do to mitigate our impact. Now, and it's important to point out, many of these things we already know and we're already taking steps to mitigate them. But are they all the right steps and are they being done in a way that is truly going to have an impact? And this is where I think and feel that policy decisions are being made because information is being distorted and misrepresented. And I would like to know why. Who benefits from that? So what I'm learning is there is a tremendous amount of misinformation that is guiding that public policy. Each of these policy and regulation changes drives up the cost of living for all of us. I recently interviewed Quick Dick McDick, a Saskatchewan farmer, who says quite pointedly, you can't produce food without access to fossil fuels. It's just not going to work. During our interview, he pointed out that the 2020 carbon tax increase was going to cost him an additional $3,000 to bring in his crop. Well, who pays for that? Well, ultimately, we all do because food costs are increasing. This is the case with so many aspects of our lives. Rules and regulations are driving up the cost of living. Rules and regulations that are, we are told to accept so that we can meet carbon abatement targets that may not even be achievable or needed. I reached out to Friends of Science because a number of credible sources I trust put me in touch with the group. It's a small not-for-profit organization that is run by scientists. Scientists who do not take money from special interest groups, contrary to what has been reported about them. Friends of Science dares to present scientific information on climate, and when they do, they are shouted at and openly denounced. Not so much on the merits of the science, but simply shouted down for speaking up. 
I invited Michelle Sterling of Friends of Science to join me to tell me about the organization and the scientists she speaks on behalf of and why we are in this climate of fear, existential fear and fear of discussion. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. For the past 14 to 15 years, I've been watching quite intensely the discussions around climate. And over the years, I've seen the focus shift from one of concern to one of outright fear of catastrophe. So much so that the end of the world as we know it appears to be imminent. How did we get to this point, this understanding? What and who pushes this agenda and why? Climate change has become a huge commercial entity. It's a $1.5 trillion business worldwide. And uh, Roger Pielke Jr. recently presented some evidence and a new paper that's on, actually with Justin Ritchie out of BC, um, showing that this uh, scenario, the most catastrophic scenario, has become deeply embedded in scientific literature, in the media, and in all commentary. Now this originated with two green billionaires, Michael Bloomberg and Thomas Stair, who apparently put together this report called Risky Business. Um, it was very well funded, it was very well distributed, and particularly, of course, in financial circles, because that's where those gentlemen operate. This is based on the RCP 8.5, Reg Representative Concentration Pathway 8.5, um, which is the most catastrophic scenario. It would require us using five to seven times the coal that we presently use, has no climate mitigation, and is very, very unlikely. Uh, today, most uh, mainstream scientists dismiss it as ridiculous. But this is where people like Mark Carney are basing their views on, oh my God, we're all going to die unless we address the climate crisis. This is where climate emergency finds its roots. Michael Bloomberg, the Michael Bloomberg of Bloomberg News, the Michael Bloomberg who was the mayor of New York, the Michael Bloomberg who was going to, then wasn't going to, and ultimately did run for the Democratic nomination, that Michael Bloomberg? Yes, that one. And, uh, you know, this is also affirmed by research by Matthew Nisbet, who's a very well-respected uh, climate science communications expert. He did a uh, paper in 2018 that was published in Wiley. Um, and uh, he shows, he's been tracking these uh, philanthrop philanthropists and, and uh, wealthy green billionaires for some time now. Um, he shows that hundreds of millions of dollars every year has been pumped into the climate story by these billionaires funding academics, funding universities, funding nonprofit journalism, and uh, funding anti-fossil fuel activities. Uh, particularly Bloomberg has funded Sierra Club for hundreds of millions of dollars. He's not the only one, but you know, because he's got a higher profile and uh, that's why I keep bringing him up. Hmm. I find it very interesting that you mentioned Mr. Bloomberg because last year, as he was contemplating his run for the nomination, I had an opportunity to interview him in Toronto. We were talking about the similarities and differences between Canada and the United States. And from his perspective, the differences between the two countries were minor, except for one thing. He said, we have to do something about that dirty oil in Alberta. And he was very specific. Well, you know, it's very interesting to see that, for instance, uh, there's a CBC story of Thomas Stair uh, up in um, Fort Chip helping put solar panels on a lodge. Uh, you know, he's a very busy guy. He's a very high-profile guy. He started a big green jobs campaign in California that didn't result in any jobs. What is he doing up in Fort uh, Chip, um, right beside the contentious oil sands, you know, he's a hedge fund investor. If you look at Powerline, you can see there's an article about his eco-hypocrisy, where to the front of the world, he's green. Mm -hmm. But apparently, his uh, Farallon Capital has been snapping up coal stocks around the world. So, you know, there's this whole thing in investment circles called mm -hmm. vulture investment. Yeah. So if you can drive down the value of shares, well, somebody's going to buy them. All these universities that are divesting of fossil fuels, they're not saving the planet. There's somebody out there who's going to buy those, <laughs> those mm -hmm. shares and capitalize on it. While we naive, planet-saving, nice, 
kind, sorry, eternally sorry Canadians are just giving away our riches to people who, you know, may have many different private funds, hedge funds, whatever, that could capitalize on these uh, losses to us. Well, Dr. Patrick Moore addresses this topic when he says there are so many people who are complicit in misrepresenting facts about climate. It has led to a point where now, if I endeavor to have a discussion about the science and the actual science of climate, the general consensus is that the science is settled. It's hard to argue when somebody says that. So I did a lot of research about science, only to learn that until you map all of time and space, science apparently will never be settled. And despite trying to even have a discussion about the nature of science, so many people accept the idea that the science is settled about climate and that it's a fact. That's one of my areas of deep interest is this 97% consensus. And this is what uh, Robert Cialdini would call a social proof. And uh, his book Influence covers a lot of this territory. So, you know, you must wonder why this 97%. And when I first started working with Friends of Science, I said, why are all these surveys 97%? Like, I'm, I'm not good at math. But even for me, <laughs> I could see if you have four or five different groups of people, you're asking them different questions, you're surveying them in different ways, how can you consistently come up with 97%? Mm -hmm. So one of the first reports we did uh, as a group with me on board was to review all of these 97% consensus surveys. And you find that it's, it's a sham, but it works very well on the public. And why? Because we're social creatures, we have a herd mentality, in times when we lived a primitive life, when we were living a hand-to-mouth existence, being part of the herd meant you would survive. And if you were that 3% ostracized heretic, well, you would die. If you were forced out of the herd, that was it. You would die alone on the prairies or alone on the ice floor or alone in the jungle. So these are very deeply embedded feelings within people. So the 97% consensus claim works very well. Mm -hmm. And most people don't understand science. They're not in a position to read the IPCC report and say, well, you know, that's funny because, you know, look at the change in temperature. Here is hundredths of a degree. You know, when you look at a, a graph that shows hundredths or tenths of a degree, of course you'll see a rise. But if you looked at it on a thermometer, you wouldn't see any rise at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but people don't know that. Many people are quite enumerate. I'm one of them. And they're easily swayed. So, uh, you know, if you look at the 97%, what does that leave behind? It leaves 3%. Um, and there are quite a few very interesting studies and books by um, Kipling D. Williams on ostracization and how a person experiences being ostracized as actually physical pain. Mm -hmm. um, he calls it the social kiss of death. And we've seen that with, um, with scientists who hold rational dissenting views on climate, or even citizens who speak up and say, you know, I, I'm not too sure about this. Ooh, they immediately jump on people, say you're a denier, so, you know, equating you to some kind of Holocaust genocidal criminal. Um, and they say, oh, you know, you're not a climate scientist. You don't have peer-reviewed. Uh, he's, he's been dismissed by others. So uh, all of a sudden, that 3%, you know, those people suffer. They actually really suffer because of these attacks on them. Judith Curry would be a perfect example of that. She was the head of the Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department at Georgia Institute of Technology, and she started to question. Now, she didn't outright deny. She just started to question the way the science was being expressed and then ultimately retired from Georgia Tech saying the IPCC was distorting the science and scientists were not dealing adequately with uncertainties. And when she said that, she was pilloried in particular by Skeptical Science, an Australian website that set out to make Ms. Curry unhirable in academia. And sadly, that's what happened. In 2012, she was asked to step down. Later, she said she had become a victim of mainstream climate science's overreaction to criticism. She believed the climate community had adopted a fortress mentality, defending insiders and refusing access to outsiders.
Well, again, uh, Roger PLK Jr. has been looking into this, and he's found that there's a blacklist that's been developed. And it is by these fellows out of Australia. In 2015, I interviewed Professor William Happer at uh, Princeton University. He's a renowned physicist and has been studying climate for decades. Despite this, he does not present himself as a climate scientist. He's a physicist. And he doesn't present himself as a climate scientist because that designation wasn't available until recently. Right. Well, climate science is really, uh, you know, the roots of it are really in earth sciences, geology, geophysics, geochemistry. Uh, that study, you know, they go back to James Hutton out of the 1700s, the father of modern day geology. Um, the Man Who Discovered Time, I think, is the name of a book about him. And really, the geology group, the geoscience group, the earth sciences, are the ones who, who informed us that, wow, you know, this mountain is X number of millions of years old, and mm -hmm. this lava comes from that um, uh, volcano, and this happened X number of millions or billions of years ago. Um, you know, and, and in that time, there was this type of concentration of CO2. And in that time, there were these kinds of changes in, in flora and fauna. And why? Because we have the records here that we can actually look at them in our hands. Right. Um, so, you know, it's really a shame that the whole concept of what is a climate scientist or who qualifies as a climate scientist has become so distorted. Because many people who are claimed to be climate scientists, and I would say like Gavin Schmidt, of NASA GISS, um, probably a highly qualified person, but in math. So, you know, mm -hmm. a math modeler. Uh, so, uh, you know, are, are you going to say that this is the only person and the only discipline that can evaluate and direct what's happening climatically on our very co complex Earth? Well, I hope not, because Greg Flato of Environment Canada was presented to me as a climate scientist. And he doesn't have a climate science degree either. He has a PhD in engineering science, in particular, numerical modeling. And he says the people who work with him have a variety of different science credentials. But climate scientist is not one of them because to say you are a climate scientist specifically is very difficult to do because of the complexity of climate. Yes, it's an interdisciplinary field. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even as Dr. Nir Shaviv said in an interview that I did with him, he said, you know, it turns out that to understand the forces of climate, you need an astrophysicist because the sun affects all of these very complex uh, dynamics on mm -hmm. Earth as well. So, um, you know, it's not just because the sun is going to be warmer or cooler. There are many dynamic features of the sun, many cycles of the sun, the ways that the solar wind affects Earth, um, lots of very complex issues going on that we're not really in a position to evaluate it fully. We only sent up the Solar Dynamics Observatory in, uh, I think it was in 2005. Mm -hmm. So Michelle, Friends of Science receives an awful lot of negative attention because there's this sense that the organization does not accept the idea that human activity is affecting the climate. Where do you stand on that? I do believe firmly that humans are affecting climate on Earth. I probably go more with uh, Roger PLK Sr.'s work, mm -hmm. where he's talking about land use, water diversion, deforestation, agriculture. All these things do have very significant local, regional climate impacts, but they're also how we live. Yes. You know, we can't stop agriculture, and we can't stop using forests. Um, so we can manage them bet better. We do quite a good job, I think, in Canada, but, you know, around the world we can do a much better job. But mm -hmm. we, we live on this earth, and it's almost like many of the activists feel like somehow, you know, we live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And perhaps because people live in, in urban context, they don't really understand how things are made or how things get to market. To your point about agriculture, we all rub up against it. We all eat, and yet most of us have no idea how food is produced and delivered to us. But that doesn't stop us from making pronouncements about how to produce food. And most of the time, outsiders to agriculture are wrong in their perceptions and understanding of how to tend the earth and animals, largely because that sector is also so complex. So let me once again uh, refer back to Judith uh, Curry, because when it comes to climate, 
which is even more complex, Ms. Curry says that you cannot create a model that represents climate. The outcomes of the model will be wrong. And then if you want to build your next model on top of the outcomes of the first one, no matter what adjustments you make to reflect the actual climate, uh, they too are wrong. And this sets off what she calls the hawk moth effect, which makes the business of predicting climate improbable, if not impossible. Uh, Professor Christopher Essex, um, I interviewed him in Porto, and he, the first question he asked me is, he said, well, uh, can you tell me what equations are essential? Because this is a journalist pop quiz, and if you can't answer this question about the essential equations of climate, um, then I won't do an interview with you. And your answer was? <laughs> um, it's the Navier-Stokes equations. Which is, I, because these I'm going to... These are extremely complex differential equations. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think the simplest example, there was an article in Quora one time talking about how when you pour cream into coffee and you stir the cream, uh, you know, it doesn't mix in just one swirl. Like you can see it going everywhere. These are related to the fluid dynamics of air and water. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I'm talking far out of my depth. But, <laughs> yes. but, but, he, but uh, Professor Essex said to me, the thing is, these are such complex movements that to do an accurate 10-year forecast uh, on these kinds of fluid dynamics would take um, the age of the universe squared. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have people who are doing 100-year forecasts and saying, no, this is accurate. Like, these are very, very complex uh, scenarios. All and right. not to mention, you know, we recently had an example here in Alberta where um, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe and her colleague Ann Stoner did a report called Alberta's Climate Future. And in it, they do say that uh, models are able to account for volcanoes and solar influences they, yes, exactly, I see that kind yeah. of, <laughs> what? Um, they, they may be able to account for them, but they can't predict them. Well, how do they account for clouds? Because as Judith Curry points out, climate models don't account for clouds. And if you don't include clouds, then you can't make accurate uh, predictions because a cloud in a moment does have a direct impact on temperature. That's right. Yes, and so, you know, there, there are all these factors where you can, in a model, you can probably see how it works. But, they, you know, that's what I think it's uh, Suki... Uh... Suki Manabi. He was a pioneer of climate modeling. You know, in an interview that I did with Freeman Dyson, he told me that Dr. Manabi told him that models were used to work to understand what has happened in climate, but not what will happen. That's right, yeah, and I think in the early IPCC reports they say that quite yeah. clearly. Uh, but again, um, you know, the problem is also that society and politicians want some kind of certainty. Mm -hmm. And actually Professor Essex wrote a great uh, essay called uh, uh, Caveman, Climate and Computers. And he talks about how um, this computer has become this computer model has become a thing where you need a shaman to in, interpret it, mm -hmm. right? And there's almost this tribal affair going on where people have to bow down to the climate model or they club, club, club you into silence. Right. And it's quite an interesting, um, rather artistic uh, interpretation of the challenges of a climate scientist or a scientist saying, look, I don't agree with what you're saying. I find that it's more complex than this CO2 thing and a carbon tax will solve it. That is nonsense for most uh, scientists. In a conversation I had with Dr. Dick Beamish, a lifelong salmon scientist with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, we were at a scientific conference and he stops me and he barks out, McNesh, what do you know about length of day? Uh, to which I blurted out something like uh, 23 hours and 56 minutes. Close, he says, and then adds, did you know that the rotation of the Earth can change by up to six milliseconds? Well, of course, I didn't know that. His point was, where does the energy to speed up or slow down the rotation of the Earth come from? Because as he referred to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So he says, in other words, 
it can't be new energy, it can't be dissipated energy, it's shifting energy. So one of, if not the only major source of that shifting energy is the oscillation in the oceans. This oscillation affects food production for salmon, but it is unpredictable. And so this brings me back to Judith Curry, who points out that climate models do not include ocean oscillation, which to her means modeling is an imprecise tool. Right. And, uh, you know, I'd add another factor to that. Uh, I, I've read quite a bit of work of uh, Professor Wiss Yim um, on geothermal activity in the ocean. And he's got some very convincing material showing that certain subliminal underwater eruptions have greatly affected the temperature of the ocean in that area and the current going up to, say, the Arctic. It affects sea ice variability in the Arctic. Um, it, in his uh, research, he's found that it affected the drought cycle in mm -hmm. Australia. Um, and these are things that we never hear about in the mainstream press. Nobody talks about it. Yet, under the ocean, this is an area we know very little about. And the oceans are 71% of the world's, or, or of the Earth's surface. Surface, yeah. So, and as deep as the Himalayan mountains are high in some places. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these mysteries have not been explored to any great extent. So the science cannot be said to be settled. Going back to Dr. Patrick Moore, in a conversation with him, he posed the question, do you know what happens if we get to 150 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere? That's right, we're done for. Life on Earth will cease to exist. In reading Charles C. Mann's book, The Wizard and the Prophet, he points out that photosynthesis evolved about mm, 3.5 billion years ago and it was a freak of nature. It only happened once, and then it did this miraculous thing, and in doing so created an enzyme known as Rubisco. That enzyme's job is to pull carbon out of CO2, and it's been doing it for the last three and a half billion years, all the while sequestering carbon. So in another interview, I asked University of British Columbia climate scientist Simon Donner to help me understand why if all the carbon in the world has already existed and will continue to exist, because as we know, going back to that first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed, why is there a problem? If all we're doing is recycling carbon, why is this going to lead to a catastrophic outcome? I think a lot of this began, say, at the beginning of the climate movement, where people uh, assumed that carbon dioxide was the factor that changed climate. And this was based on the early work of Fourier and Arrhenius and some of these other people. Mm -hmm. But as of the 2013 IPCC report, and uh, this is where Judith Curry gets her statement that CO2 is not the control knob that can fine-tune climate, we found that there had been a huge uptick in concentration of CO2, much of it from human activity and industry, mm -hmm. and yet temperatures had flatlined since about 1998 to right. about 2015, 16, maybe even a bit after. They've now started to rise again slowly, but nothing in concert with the uh, rise in carbon dioxide, which, mm -hmm. which basically defeats that theory. So, you know, there are dozens of papers out now, I think there's over a hundred papers now that state that the warming effect or the climate sensitivity of carbon dioxide is nominal to nil. Mm -hmm. So it's not really the warming factor and we don't have to have that same catastrophic view. And again, this is where we go back to what I spoke about earlier on and the representative concentration pathway of 8.5. Uh, that would account for a huge volume of CO2 in the atmosphere from coal burning um, and without any climate mitigation whatsoever. So uh, that catastrophic view, even based on an understanding now of the effect of carbon dioxide, is, is uh, not relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, that risk is, is greatly reduced. So I keep coming back to trying to understand the agenda. Well, in, uh, I think it was the 1970s. In the 1970s, there was a lot of pollution. And yes, there was. Lots of air pollution, lots of smog in L.A. and over the big cities. And, um, you know, people began to understand the, the dynamics of human use of fossil fuels, the aerosols and emissions. So the Clean Air Acts were incorporated in 
various countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that they developed to reduce sulfur dioxide and stop acid rain was a cap and trade method. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, very useful at the time because many of these plants could not overnight shut down their operations or, or install filtration. So this cap and trade method became um, economically uh, a way of making money for some companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think about that time people said, well, gee, that's a good idea. <laughs> Why don't we apply that to something else? What else can we apply it to? And carbon dioxide was one of those things. So then um, hmm. it was actually Enron and McKinsey that developed this whole scheme of wind and wind power creating offsets and natural gas, and these um, uh, two things creating a whole new market of carbon trading. And Enron was very much in favor of the Kyoto Accord. They pushed it really hard. And um, we all know that Enron collapsed in a heap of ashes, and partly because they were playing this uh, nonsensical game. Because, you know, I think one of the best descriptions of the carbon markets is in uh, Mark Shapiro's work in Harper's Magazine of 2010, mm -hmm. where he says, the carbon markets entail the lack of delivery of an invisible substance to no one. Hmm. Okay, so people are actually buying and selling this non-existent, non-essential, non-productive thing, but it's become a huge global market because it's a way of corporations, industrial corporations, avoiding... Um, uh, special taxes on them by incorporating carbon trading into their business model. Mm -hmm. But I liken this to something that happened in Holland in 1600s called tulipomania. And there's a and I would say there are many parallels with with this. And you can find it in a little book by Charles McKay called um, Mass Public Delusions. And, Mass Public Delusions. Yes, yeah. and in in the 1600s in Holland, tulips became very popular. They came from Turkey, and people started trading uh, tulips and trying to make money off trading tulips. And the trade became to such a level that they were actually trading on offsets on the prod progeny of future tulips that had not yet even been planted. And the price became astronomical. You could, for, the, for a tulip bulb, you could actually uh, trade it for a ship, for a house, for a thousand pounds of cheese. Like it, it's it's unbelievable, but it happened, and wow. it nearly bankrupted Holland because at one time it all fell down, because of course you're trading in things that don't exist and don't have a useful purpose. So I liken that very much to the climate mm -hmm. popular delusion, and the corporate and uh, carbon trading interest behind it. I, and you know, I see this as a repeating phenomenon throughout history. We've had the South Sea bubble, we had the Mississippi scheme. Um, I showed you earlier the Book of Miracles from uh, Augsburg in the 1500s, where you know, people were ascribing all kinds of esoteric and, and uh, uh, deus ex machina kind of events uh, with the, the changing climate. You know, it's a, it's a common popular delusion. And uh, this time, somebody tacked it right onto the public psyche and it's taken off. You know, the public are really deeply entrenched in fear of climate change. They really are to the point where it is driving up the cost of living. It's changing laws, it's reshaping the landscape, and in so many cases having devastating impacts on economies. Tell me about Friends of Science. What is your mission? What's your mandate? Well, uh, Friends of Science was formed back in 2002 by a group of Earth, atmospheric, and solar scientists and a couple of business people. And they, um, they saw that the Kyoto Accord didn't really make sense to them scientifically and economically. They saw it would be totally devastating for Canada. So uh, they were just a small group of people who thought, well, you know, surely if we get some information to politicians and help them understand these complexities, and they, the theme of Friends of Science is providing insight on climate science. So we're not trying to tell people what to think. We're trying to say, look, it's a bit more complicated than what people are saying. Please consider these uh, realities and these parameters. Um, so that's what they began doing. But um, 
you know, very quickly, and we see now in some of the um, documents that we found, there was a, a concerted effort by the other side to, you know, shut us down, to shut us up, to uh, make us look like crazy fools or, you know, funded by big oil. But it's really just a non-profit society. We operate on about $150,000 a year from our members, which we've done for, like, almost 17 years now. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're not rolling in dough. We don't have big benefactors, and nobody's driving a limo. Um, and uh, we just simply want to get people thinking more clearly about what climate change is and the science behind it. And more recently, we've been working with Robert Lyman. He's a former public servant of 27 years. He was a diplomat for 10 years. He worked on the GHG file for much of his career. And he's offered us many great reports and economic insights. So, um, you know, we've expanded our discussion somewhat from strictly the science to try and reach the general public. And uh, I guess that's, you know, sort of where my role has come in as a non-scientist. I talk with the scientists and I say, well, what does this really mean? You know, t please tell me in, in ordinary person's terms so that I can in turn tell the public. And um, that's what we try to do. We try to translate these things into, um, into concepts that people could understand a bit easier. And uh, we, we hope that people will speak up you know, if they have concerns, because you're quite right, the costs are astronomical, and there's no benefit. You know, it's one thing if you say, we think there should be um, scrubbers on all coal plants in the world. Okay. That makes good sense. Yeah. You know, it would be expensive to do, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. Certainly, based on the amount of money we spend on climate initiatives, it would be cheap. It would be good for everybody. It would be good for the environment. That would be beneficial. I agree. But, you know, carbon taxing, uh, you know, the, the pensioners and uh, the food that they buy will be taxed as food. The transportation of that food will be taxed. The store will have extra GHG taxes on their lighting and everything else. You know, this is all going to pile up and mm -hmm. make life impossible. You know, really push people into right. heat or eat poverty. And there's no benefit. I find it interesting that we're in the midst of our response to COVID-19 as we record this conversation. The economy is collapsing. The government is providing economic relief to everyone and anyone who appears to need it. Even still, the government is going ahead with its carbon tax increase, which as farmers are telling me is adding thousands of dollars to their cost. Well, Canada has a climate deal with France, and part of that climate deal is to push carbon markets worldwide. <laughs> mm -hmm. So and this is a story that's been hardly covered at all in the media. No one talks about it. Uh, but Europe is really the center of carbon trading. And um, those markets collapsed with the COVID-19 shutdown. Because, of course, no need to trade carbon when there's <laughs> no emissions, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of funny because their end game, if you get to net zero, there won't be a carbon market either. You know, I don't know if they've really thought that through. But it is absurd that people like Mark Carney, the IMF, um, uh, Guterres at the UN, they're all pushing a green recovery. And we know that, that renewables and carbon uh, pricing, carbon taxes, have pushed many countries and millions of people to the brink. Mm -hmm. And why would these people who supposedly are financial wizards be pushing that? It's, it's insane. As Michael Moore recently pointed out in his latest documentary, Planet of the Humans, he has looked under the hood and seen that green energy is big business and it's not always green. Now, his credentials as a storyteller, I'll agree, are exceptional, and I have to admit that I've seen his mm, storytelling in the past as being biased, very biased, and left-leaning as a documentarian. Um, Okay, that's fine. At least, you know, you have an idea of where Michael Moore is coming from. And still, here is a guy who goes out to seek answers to truly understand what's going on. And, you know, to Michael Moore's credit, he really does care. He, like so many others who have been and continue to be passionate about protecting uh, our Mother Earth, are celebrated, <laughs> that is, until they look under the covers and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you look at that uh, paper that I mentioned before, the work of Matthew Nisbet, you'll see that these uh, 
foundations and philanthropists have been funding environmental groups all over the world. Uh, they actually have a global plan to implement cap and trade, carbon pricing, and put $12 trillion worth of renewables on the grid. Um, but they've been funding environmental groups to beat the drum for causes that would um, you know, force the government to implement their policies. And uh, of course, people have assumed that this is quite grassroots and native and normal, and this is what the public want, when it's actually what these green billionaires are paying these people to do. Um, and when you look at the list of funding, you'll see they funded a whole section on electric vehicles because they have investments there. And part of this is related to, uh, I think, the work of Peter Drucker. Mm -hmm. Back in the 70s, he yes. predicted that there would be a thing called pension fund socialism, where pension funds would become the largest holders of corporations in North America. And what's happened in the interim, of course, is that there's a huge divide between the unfunded liabilities of pension funds and um, the reality of the marketplace. And markets have slowed down. So I think they've tried to create new markets. Like imagine if you have to re, uh, replace all the vehicles in the world with electric vehicles, that creates a whole new market, mm -hmm. a huge one, right? Yeah. Whether or not it can be done is something else. But, you know, that in... in um, in some terms, people would say, oh, well, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's throw everything out and start over again. Um, so on, on the business model, they seem to have been driving in that direction. But in practical terms, you know, if you ask an actuary, what is the actual cost to society of junking all the existing vehicles and trying to go to EV? Or is there enough power generation for the proposed EV? Maybe in France, which runs on nuclear, maybe in Norway, which runs on hydro, but certainly not in Canada. You're right. Even though we have massive hydro resources here, there's not enough power in Canada for the EV policy we presently have. I think my interest is not dissimilar to yours. That is, I want to be armed with as accurate information as I can so that I can make an informed choice because making uninformed choices is going to drive up the cost of living and sadly may have little impact on climate. That's what I fear. And I want to protect this precious planet. This is the only home we have, but I worry we're taking our eye off of tangible, physical issues that we can address. Right, and you know, locally, uh, that's a place that you can do something effective, whereas when you look uh, at uh, this sort of global view, you find that the people pushing the climate movement are saying, oh, well, let's not have coal plants for people in Africa because that would be dirty and bad. We'll give them solar panels. So you find that groups like the Anglican Church Pension Fund is invested in solar panels, but the solar panels that they give to the people in, in Africa, which are probably quite useful, but the, the rate, the interest rate, <laughs> they're on a lend-lease program where they have a chip inside the panel so they can shut off the power to it unless you keep paying the fee. So the poorest people on Earth are being ripped off for astronomical in interest rates. Michelle, I'm concerned. I'm concerned we're being manipulated. I'm concerned about protecting this world. And I'm equally concerned that when I or someone else dares to question the science of climate and or potential motives, the word heretic isn't far away, a heretic that apparently is backed by big oil companies. Not true as far as I can see. I can't even get those oil companies to come on my show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is so funny because actually when you look at how wind and solar, uh, every wind and solar plant needs a natural gas plant to back it up. And for big oil, wind and solar is a great niche market. Yeah, yeah. You need special lubricants for the, for the turbines, um, you need to sell way more oil and gas to make all of those wind and solar things. They don't mind, you know. Mm -hmm. Plus, if they're, as a corporation, investing in it, they get subsidies, they have happy shareholders, all the climate activists say, look, even they are going green, and they give them a free pass. So, yeah. you know, it's absurd that people say that. Thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation. One that causes me great concern because I'd rather the push to address climate change was directed by 
truly well-intentioned people and not by business interests that are piggybacking off of a genuine concern. My pleasure. Thank you, Stuart.